Uh, thanks so much for coming out. Uh, this is a very special evening for me because when I went to St. Joe High School in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, I always wanted to go to St. Michael's College, but I didn't have the grades to go there. <laughs> and one of the reasons why I wanted to go was because of a good friend that we caddied together at the country club of Pittsfield came up this way and made quite a name for himself, Dick Falkenbush, who led uh, a great St. Michael's basketball team and then later on became coach. And it's very peculiar how things carry on as the days go on. We were in Florida just a month ago, my wife Belita and I, and there was a man named Mr. Woods with a Boston cap on. And I told him I was going to be speaking at St. Michael's College. And I mentioned Dick Falkenbush. And uh, he says, oh, I taught his son school history in nearby Sheltonham or Cholchester. Or <laughs> yes, and, uh, but it was absolutely terrific. And another reason why I didn't go to St. Mike's other than grades was uh, because I was heavily recruited elsewhere in 1967. <laughs> the US military wanted me. <laughs> so I didn't have too, too much chance in avoiding them. Uh, but I'm here, thank you so much. In 1979, I walked a donkey around the coast of Ireland. The journey took eight months, 1,720 miles. We spent 150 nights in different farmhouses where I was never once asked a penny for lodgings. We traveled the north as well as the south with my dear donkey, Missy McDermott, a lovely turf-colored five-year-old mare. The old men at Radigan's pub where I started my journey and ended my journey thought I was out of my mind. <laughs> but we persevered, and we traveled eight to 10 miles a day, and I always said we traveled three times slower than a fat caddy in July. <laughs> and a fat caddy in July walked just like my dear donkey. <laughs> and the old men would often say, get up on the cart and tip her along, will ya? <laughs> But I couldn't, and there were several reasons why I did not. Number one, all the men at Radigan said, if a donkey could do it, take the journey, leave in April from Radigan's pub, circle the entirety of the country, and be back no later than Christmas Eve, traveling the 16 to 1800 miles, there were wagers being made. <laughs> they said, I need to befriend a mare, and they were telling me I should have chosen a jack. But I did not want to take a jack around Ireland because I didn't want two jackets, <laughs> me and him. But either which way, I took the mare and I walked alongside of her because a mare could lose heart. She had her permanence. Whatever she did during the course of a day, she always came back to her shed or buyer at night. The old men, all of whom had worked with donkeys in the past, said, she'll lose heart, she won't make sense of your wanderings, and she'll stop her going. So I said, well, another good reason then is to be alongside of her and sing to her, to get to know her as a friend, a companion. Well, people would say, that won't take long till that novelty wears off. <laughs> but either way, we did this, and there were other reasons. She would spook, get very excited with oil slicks in the road. Uh, manhole covers, she would walk around. Uh, oil slicks, blown newspapers, air brakes, all that made her very jittery. And more so, and to be honest with you all, every time I got up on the car to tip her along, she would not move for me. <laughs> The old farmers then would say, get up on a cart. Walking an ass around Ireland is like hailing a taxi in the city and then go running home behind it. <laughs> but I'm in Galway, Monave, a, a wonderful area, nobody about, a great bog ahead of me of five miles, Kilsolan Bog. And this great gentleman stopped and says, get up on the cart, give her her works, let her tip along, it will do her good. And I says, I can't. And he said, are you on a charity walk, perhaps? <laughs> and I said, yes, that's it. I'm on a charity walk. He said, well, there'd be nobody in these parts, none of your sponsors that would ever see you. <laughs> and I said, well, it really
really wouldn't be fair to them. <laughs> and he looked at me with these dewy, red-rimmed eyes, shook my hand warmly, and said, the greatest thing God has ever put on this planet was an honest man. <laughs> So I walked with the dear donkey another so many hundreds of miles. There were many great things. 79, Last of the Donkey Pilgrims. Uh, we struggled with the title. Well, I struggled with a lot. It took me 25 years to write the book. But the title did not come easy, and it was a brother, Malachi Daly, who called me the last of the Donkey Pilgrims. And the Donkey Pilgrims years ago was that individual who would go to a holy well in search of a cure. Also, there would be no other real transportation for somebody that would have been suffering at the turn in the 19th, 20th century, except the donkey. And many cures there were for toothache and earache and all sorts of spasms. And there was a holy well in Donegal that really struck me, St. Karen's well, for homesickness. And this was one of the most used of the holy wells where people would stride or straddle the donkey's back and dip their hands, dip their beads, ask for a prayer that their homesickness would cease because at that time, actually 1910s through the 30s, 1940s, if people left their home county, their families, chances were most likely that they would never see each other again and people pined for one another. And this particular well was just for that particular purpose. Uh, last of the donkey pilgrims also, because I do not believe that another donkey in a cart could walk around Ireland. The roads have changed significantly. Many times you can't have animals no longer on the roads, including the Connor Pass, which people may know. Um, but it was a great time, 79, because there was an oil strike, not an oil strike, there was a postal strike that lasted five months, which cut tourism by two-thirds. There was the OPEC oil crisis in 79. There was great troubles in the north. Uh, Ulster was a real tinderbox of activity. Lord Mountbatten had been assassinated during my donkey go-round, and the Pope, John Paul, was making his historical visit to Knox Shrine. All those items together left the donkey and myself to the road. 1,000 times during our walk, we had to walk around a knuckle of road that left us basically dry to traffic. Anybody could hit us one way or the other. It just did not happen. There was no traffic. It was the dear donkey and myself, and we tipped the law. I want to read one story from the book. I'll punch out the slides and um, questions and answers. And uh, I do like doing this. So please, Adam, at 11 o'clock, could you tell me to kind of wrap it up? <laughs> you know, because, you know, I was at the Lady of the Elms College back in October when the Red Sox and the Yankees were in the deciding seventh, seventh game. And, uh, oh, there were five or six women right up front, eager to hear the donkey man, and these seven in the back, itching to get out, right? <laughs> and I started my program, and I said, you know, I'm really sensing a discomfort in the back of the room. And I said, I suppose you people there, there in the back might be interested in that baseball match that's going on tonight. Well, I'll tell you, I'll have you out for the seventh inning stretch. <laughs> but either way, yeah. The North was a, a testy situation, but I refused not to enter the North Country despite what was going on beforehand. But I wanted to help my donkey, Missy, a little bit by lightening her load. And I thought at best that I would purchase a tent to take the place of the old ash waddle tent, a very impractical tent that I had set out with. So my brother, I mean my cousin John Conroy gave me four 20 pound notes that I put safely into my right hand pocket. And I went to buy Missy a tent. I should say a couple of little things about Missy to begin with, but there's a lot to say and I'll save them for when I'm showing the slides. But here I am, 
in Dublin, Grafton Street, to purchase a tent to lighten the donkey's load with my 80 pounds. And I met this little redhead. And I just preface it by saying that um, I had spent two nights with the travelers prior to this, the tinkers. The first, an encampment in Calorgan, and the second um, uh, in County uh, Wexford with a lovely family. My reverie of bygone days was broken when a dirty-faced redhead poked a soiled kerchief beneath my nose and charmlessly wheedled, Spare coppers, mister? Spare coppers? This runny-nosed waif, a knacker and a Dublin vernacular, was of the traveling breed who had of late given up their painted wagons for the grimy ghettos of the city. The child God blessed, Mark, had freckles that splotched her face as though God had applied them too hurriedly with a blunt brush, and they ran right up to her matching shock of dreaded red hair. The Irish have a particular disdain for redheads, and I asked Ned Kelleher one night, why is that the case? And he said, you don't know. And I said, no, I do not know. He said, first of all, the Vikings were redheads. And look what they did to this country. And then Queen Bess, she was a redhead. And look what she did to this country. And then he paused and said, and anybody with a kernel of learning knows that Judas Iscariot was a redhead. <laughs> Very long-memoried Irish. Confronted with such an imp, Dubliners seemed to respond, bugger off, you bloomin' redhead. I, however, thinking about Aggie's little ones and having shared the fellowship of the road with the traveling tribe, delved into my left-hand pocket and sacrificed my loose change, eight pence, to her ragged cloth. Not satisfied with my modest donation, the girl continued to backpedal before me, chanting her beggary, her, her eyes wide under my nose, insistent and entirely too close for comfort. I've given you what I have, I shook her off, not counting the four 20-pound notes deep and secure in my right-hand pocket. Now bug her off, you bloomin' redhead. Hearing that magic utterance, she disappeared through the throngs and was gone. Proud to have the knack of it, I strutted a few steps before an unsettling intimation entered my brain. Fumbling madly into my right pocket, I scoured a cavernous emptiness of lint and fluff to find I had been picked clean. My sudden wealth had suddenly vanished. Crazed with adrenaline, I blindly bolted after her, upsetting shoppers, dodging prams, and nearly bowling over octogenarians, and took one desperate lunge at this fleeing itinerant, barely catching hold of her hand. I want my money, I gasped, securing her by the wrist. Ouch, you're killing me, mister, she screamed, kicking my shins as a swelling crowd encircled us. For the love of God, she wailed, dropping to her knees in theatrical pain. Is there not a decent man among you to save me from this madman's grasp? <laughs> I want my money, I persisted pleading now as much to the thickening congregation as to herself, for they seemed to be forgetting their own centuries-old disdain for this misbegotten clan of wayfaring robbers. When I released one wrist, the young lass stopped her struggle and wiped her eyes with her fisted hand, leaving a portrait so angelic, so forlorn, so God-forsaken, that it would bring a tear to a glass eye. <laughs> then, lifting her head as if to bravely face the consequence of her crime, she slowly opened her paw for all to see, and there, glistening in her sweaty little palm, were my eight pence, which she proceeded to drop one by one into my outstretched hand. 
The crowd, won over by this candy performance, began to take me as a pinch penny and a flagrant child abuser. He deserves a swift boot up the arse, fumed one. <laughs> Let me blacken his two eyes, threatened another. I'll kick him in the next week, volunteered a third. It was 420 she stole from me, I argued. But now, feeling the sway of the mob, I began to lose my nerve, and the red-headed miscreant winked at me with a victorious hard candy smile. I let go of my grasp and turned as if to set off on my sullen way, but I immediately spun about, catching her off guard, and snatched a kerchief secured beneath her arm. I gave it one violent shake, and lo and behold, three twenty-pound notes flooded free from a hidden fold in the cloth. Now, with the crowd returned to my side, I demanded my last 20. I haven't a bleed in money, the cheeky Colleen replied, tightening her left hand into a knuckled ball. But prying her fingers apart, I extracted my last bill, wadded to marble size, and tucked away like some nimble fingered magician. I'm giving you 10 seconds before I call the guards, I warned her. One, two, the brassy little knacker shoved her fingers into my pocket, pulled out her original eight pence, <laughs> stuck out her tongue, gave me one parting shot to the shin, and was gone. <laughs> Thank you. Now we'll to dim some lights, and I'll throw up some uh, slides on the screen. <clears throat> Take the first one. There's my dear Missy McDermott. And uh, here we are just setting out on our journey. This is one of our few uh, early days. Five-year-old, very nice, wonderful little beast when she had a full coat on. She looked very handsome. She looked like a, a snipped poodle in July and August, and I couldn't stand the sight of her. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson wrote a book about traveling uh, along the Cévennes of France in 1878 with his donkey Modestine. They traveled 110 miles in 12 days, and he said he openly wept when he sold Modestine back to the original owner in the square. Well, after 110, 110 miles in 12 days with my dear donkey Missy, I wanted a shooter with a smile on my face. <laughs> Here's my uncle uh, Mickey O'Hara, who uh, my father's older brother, who was... Um, who basically thought I was absolutely daft and setting out on this go-round. Um, can you see the pictures okay, light-wise? Okay. And this is my dear uncle Vincent Kelly on the other side of the family. And uh, here he's given me a couple of tips for the road. Uh, he's telling me here the difference between a lamb and a she-lamb. <laughs> And this is Jimmy McDermott and his uh, wife, Bridie. This is at the Easter morning parade on Sunday. He's the one that actually put wages that I would complete the journey, one of a few. He was the one who found Missy McDermott for me. He had also collected 11 donkeys that particular week, previous to my choice. Nine of them he put right back into the lorry. And I said to them, I said to Jimmy, are you sending them back to their owners tonight? He said, no, Kevin, there'll be tins of dog meal in the morning. This is the plight and was the plight of the donkey, the Irish donkey, in 1979. And it continued to get worse into the mid-'80s. And eventually now there's been a great Save the Donkey campaign in Ireland with wonderful donkey sanctuaries throughout the country. 
there I am. Uh, I mean, was there ever any wonder that my parents would worry about me? Uh, uh, you know. I never quite got it, but, you know. And the, and the beauty is everything was based, and my madness was based on spending a year in Vietnam. Well, I did not have a good year in Vietnam, but I did not have an, a horrific year in Vietnam. But there was always the case, oh, the poor lad spent a year over there in those jungles. Didn't he behave well to get out of that place? Well, if they saw me half the time, they wouldn't be saying those things about my journey there. And here's the way we looked on the road. That's a little mud box cart. I had a little bucket. I had a hazel stick in my hand. And very prim and proper we were. And uh, this is my donkey's graduating class. Uh, you, can, you can see Missy there in the corner with the boy with the blue sweater. Uh, my donkey had uh, shoes on, so she'd really have a ring off the pavement, so we could never get by a schoolhouse without the children pouring out. Rough estimates, I had met between five and 10,000 children during my donkey go round. We were always called in. I had a little fold out map. I used to pin it up against a blackboard, and I told the children where I was and where I hoped to be going. Of course, they had very little interest in me. They were always looking at the donkey. It was very hard and humbling for me to find out this whole journey wasn't about myself. Uh, there was a night we camped in a field, and it looked like a hungry night, and a mother and her handsome daughter came through the field to talk to us. Are you the lad going around Ireland with the donkey? And I said, I am. And she said, well, I saw a picture of the two of you in the newspaper. I couldn't recognize yourself, but I recognized your donkey. <laughs> that really hurt in a lot of ways. <laughs> 79 was also, Ireland was at the cusp of change. It was really a third world country. Uh, things were rather impoverished then. You'll rarely see now a family saving the hay. Everything has gone into silage, which is far easier for the farmer. You don't have to be so dependent on the weather, but it has taken some of the pastoral look of the countryside away. This is, um, is there any way uh, we can drop these lights? Or do you need them for, well, that's for, that's for the, the, the I don't know. Uh, Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's, again, please, it's all about me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, whatever, Adam, you know best. Uh, whatever, and so this is the Cathedral Rocks. Um, could I bring the picture up a little to the screen for people in the back? Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, oh, sorry. All right. Here's a picture of... Um, a man named Willie Morin. He is taking uh, a don his donkey with two Creole baskets uh, to one side of the island. And this is Clare Island. It's off the coast of Mayo uh, in Clue Bay. Is he yes, he is side straddled with the donkey. He does not have to say a word to that donkey. He puts those, those baskets on that donkey, gets on top, and walks a beautiful two miles to the back of the island, back again with two Craigs of, of turf and home. And he is now looking out beautifully at the sea, Clue Bay, with its 365 islands. It is one of the loveliest spots uh, in Ireland. Uh, I spent a night in this farmhouse, and uh, during the whole occasion, um, in the morning, I said, Why do you have the doorknob so high up on your door? And he looked the four sides of the compass, and then he whispered into my ear to keep the little fellas out. <laughs> this is myself um, with Jack Nagel. He's a very famous uh, storyteller that lived in Hag's, ha Hag's Head in County Clare. 
I have to point out that um, this whole journey started in November 1978 when I was reading The Hobbit by Tolkien. And uh, I said to my wife, Felita, my den wife, Felita, who's still my dear wife, Felita, here tonight with me, I said, Felita, I need to take a walk. And she looked at me, she said, fine, Kevin, we won't be eating for another hour or two. <laughs> and I said, I really need to take a walk. And uh, to say and to su suggest there was no hard feeling, she knitted me my sweater there that we called the road coat, you know, which saw me through many a night in Ireland. And this is a picture of O'Brien's Tower at the Cliffs of Moher in County Clare. This is the O'Briens, uh, Mr. and Mrs. He is now going off to get some potatoes from the garden. Um, you can see uh, the window, how there is very little in there, um, basically washing up detergents, beans, peas, tea, and some candy. Um, again, Ireland was severely poor in 1979. This is a man who knew how to handle a donkey. He's got a, a load, a cartload of turf there. This is a scene in Kilcatherine Churchyard on the Barra Peninsula. It's a 14th century chapel that was built and a priest came into the village and uh, the villagers said, yes, you can build your church, your house of worship, as long as we can keep some of our pagan gods attach them to the same chapel. So you can see the little pagan face of that stone there. This you can't see quite well, but this is our draw, and it's Glengesh Pass, and it was one of the steepest climbs that my donkey and I had to confront during our go-round. Before I set off on the journey, there were eight major hurdles that we had to go through. And they were the cities of uh, Cork and Dublin, Belfast and Derry, and then four great hills, Connor Pass, Dan Nancy Spray and the Green Hill up in County Antrim, and then Glen Gesh Pass, maybe perhaps the toughest of them all, which, was, which would lead us to Glen Cullum Kill. This is a little puffin out on an island called Skellig Michael or Skellig Mihal. Uh, I visited seven islands during my roundabout. Missy, however, never came out to an island. Um, it was good to leave her on the mainland. You felt like a million bucks when you weren't around her. You felt like <laughs> Superman. You could fly without that little stubborn, dumb gait of hers. And, uh, now, this, this Skellig Michael is nine miles off the coast of Kerry, and these are a stairwell, 600 steps that rises 700 feet to the very top of this. In the background, you can see the little skellig. It now has 26,000 pairs of gannets on it, the second largest colony of gannets, which is a beautiful large seabird in the world. During the famine between 1845 and 1849, only a few pairs of gannets remained because the villagers, or the people from Knightstown and Carsevine would come out in their boats and collect the eggs to keep from starving. Now they've come back full throttle. The Skellig Michael was renowned through the Middle Ages, and if you did the Stations of the Cross on this island, you would get a plenary indulgence, the same as if you journeyed to Rome. And on that walkway, this is one of the remaining stations at a cross. It's called the Wailing Woman of Jerusalem, the eighth station. Is that where they only have the divorce? No, that's Loch Derg, yeah. Or, yeah, Crow Patrick. <laughs> a lot of barefoot places there. <laughs> and this is the very top, the very top of Skellig Michael. That's the priest stone. And there you can see some beehive dwellings, those little curved areas. There's where the monks would stay. Um, they remained there between the 8th and the 13th century. Uh, the Vikings laid waste to it a couple of times, although one of their uh, Vikings, Olaf, actually was baptized there, I believe, in 1019 AD and became the first king of Norway. 
these are some of the multi-characters that would follow me around. He called himself Charlie, uh, Crazy Charlie, and I did not dispute his name. I was eating a sandwich when a rubber-tipped bow went between my donkey's ear and hit me in the forehead. And he had one of these little rubber things, and he stayed with me for two days, followed me around. Here's two others. Um, it's the little man there who had a thing for color. In fact, <laughs> in fact, the inside of his house looked like a Chinese firecracker that just went off. <laughs> he had tinsel and ribbon and he even had a, a very large mirror. And the mirror was painted, so basically only that much was clear at the very center. And I looked into it just to look at my eye looking back. That's all there was. No explanation was given. I moved on. Here's the Admiral out on Clare Island. Clare Island is such a beautiful island that I chanced to go out there. It was December 1st. We still had a couple of hundred miles to go. It was gray. The winds were rising. But I had met a postman the night before who said, meet me at Rona Key, and I'll get you across because I have to deliver mail there. I'll be on the island for two hours. You have time to wash down a pint, and then we'll go back again. I said, are you kidding? Spot on. But when we were halfway there, the winds began to batten and rise. We made it OK, but I'm in this great little pub, and the Admiral sits beside me, and he says, it's getting mighty rough out there. He said, and I know you're the donkey man, and if there's a chance that you can't get back, I'll take you about in my boat. And as he gave me those reassuring words of comfort, his empty pint glass did a 10-second jig in front of me. <laughs> so I bought him a pint, and he told me how he had sailed the seven seas from the age of 16, everywhere, saw every lighthouse from Alexandra to Cape Cod. Oh, I tell you what, he would fool a merchant marine with his knowledge of the, of the water. So anyways, the mailman said to me, are you right? We can do this. So I got on his small boat. We were washed back to Clue Bay. And he said to me, on the wheel, he says, I see you are talking to the admiral. What was he on about? So I told him. He said, I'll tell you something. The admiral is the only native of Clare Island that had never left the island. <laughs> and, it's, and, it's, and it's a three-mile distance between Clare Island and, and Westport. So you're not talking uh, the North Atlantic here. <laughs> he said, that man wouldn't walk across Clue Bay if Jesus took him by the hand. <laughs> and, and he ended by saying, in fact, one would be very hard pressed to plop that old fella into a bathtub. <laughs> this is a scene at Joe McHugh's pub in Lascanor County, Clare. An absolutely wonderful place, um, very narrow bar, cans full of botulism that were never sold, um, three canaries hanging on wire cages under this thick smoke because everybody smoked then. One of the canaries was 21 years of age with only one leg. And it would do pretty well until about 10 or 11 at night because they twitter, the three of them would actually twitter to the music, to the musicians, and it would fall off its perch. And the old men would give out to Joe McHugh, will you put a matchstick under that thing? <laughs> but on this particular night that I was there, two couples from the Americas came in, paying no heed to what was going on, the lovely scene around them in the music. They asked for two cold beers, if you have them, and two bottles of Coke with plenty of ice. And Joe McHugh was 60, a bachelor of failing health. And he wore a black suit, white shirt, very frayed, discolored, a black little funny tie, a black sailor's cap, like a captain's cap, and a brass horn that every now and then he'd blow. Say somebody was trying to get a pint for credit or somebody trying to steal a tomato towards the end, he'd give it a blast or two. 
But anyways, after he had served the Americans, one of the women said, could you direct me to the ladies' room? And he said, right there, way out that door, and you'll find it, you won't miss it. She is back in a flash, paying no heed. She said, there's no lock on that bathroom door. <laughs> and Joe McHugh picked up his horn, gave it two massive honks that stopped the musicians, shut down the little canaries, and said, ma'am, there's been no lock on that door for 25 years. And I'll tell you something, and not a word of it a lie. There hasn't been a thing stolen out of there yet. <laughs> they didn't finish their drinks. This is Ned Kelleher, wonderful man from Blenderville and County Kerry. He has that great distinction in the Rosa Tralee Festival to take the new rose to around a little jaunting car, his jaunting car, with his dear mule named Cecil, down the lovely streets of Tralee. We went to a pub called O'Dwyer's, and there was a great Irish musician playing in the corner, and an American couple, well, let's say a Canadian couple this time. <laughs> well, they were there in the corner, and they, they said, the man said, listen, shouted, listen, I'll give you 10 pounds. I'll give you 10 pounds if you sing Galway Bay for me. And Ned Kelleher shouts out, for 10 pounds, he'd bloody well swim Galway Bay for you. <laughs> These are little children up and down their own soapbox derby using what's left of a little uh, child's carriage or a pram. That little boy is bawling his eyes out all the way down and smiling all the way up. <laughs> this is a scene of a Cura, uh, one of the old boats going out to the Blasket Islands off the coast of Kerry. It's collecting cotton turf. Chickens. I was so homesick by the time I reached this particular scene in Donegal that I asked that Rhode Island Red there how the Red Sox were doing. <laughs> <laughs> little kittywakes, little great little seabirds, they always nest in pairs. This is at the Cliffs of Moor. This is Ted Fury. People may know the Fury Brothers, wonderful musicians. They put out some wonderful albums. Uh, I photographed, uh, this is at Gus O'Connor's Pub in Doolin on a Saturday evening, Saturday afternoon. He had died Sunday night uh, of a heart attack at 74 years of age. Ten years later, Belita and I were at the Parton Glass in Saratoga Springs, New York, and the Furies were playing, and we were able to give them each a copy of a print of this, and they came out very teary-eyed, very moved, and they started to set off with a lovely song called The Old Man. This is a little girl peeping out of a turf shed. Again, it wasn't me. I wasn't the little Pied Piper. It was the dear donk. <laughs> Collecting oats. It was a very wintry, wet year, 1979. They said the worst on record for 40 years. That should be, those oats should be actually golden, but you can see the harvest was not a good one that year. This is a little girl I photographed in our groom in uh, County Cork. Um, so many years later, I went back and I was able to photograph her again. And that's how she looked. I went back the third time to find out that um, she was now a nurse, a registered nurse practicing in London. When I go back the fourth time, I'm sure Mr. Sheehan will hand me out a restraining order. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it really is a longitudinal study, but this is either a very, very tall man or, you know, in a small house. But he looks down at one of the loveliest spots in all Ireland called Ballyness Bay in County Donegal, and this is what he's looking at.
Ireland has changed so significantly in the last 25 years that five years ago I was able to circle around the country again by car. And there's now two holiday homes perched to the back of that the house. And this house has now gone to ruin. So you just, in some ways, I really caught Ireland at the cusp of change. And I always felt that every step was an important step that I made because it was like seeing the curtains of a very old land or an old Europe finally falling at the end of their day. And it really certainly occurred. This is a little girl coming out to hear the clip-clop of the beast. Just uh, an, uh, a county antrum uh, chapel there. Tell you that mama yo is almost the one size as my dear donkey. <laughs> it's a father and a son. This is Ben Bain head out towards Antrim. Uh, please don't hesitate to go north if people go to Ireland. There's much less troubles there this day, and it's wonderful to uh, shuffle the cards and get people to acquaint themselves with one another. It's a very warm climate, a great country. And I was tremendously surprised and delighted with all the great help that I received during my donkey go around by people that I really suspected other. This is a scene outside of a little pub. I put away my camera and went in. Back then, it would take me two pints of Guinness to be very giddy and high headed. I'm glad I'm not taking the journey today. I might not even get out of County Ruscott. This is a man who knew how to deal with horses. I spent a night with him and his mother there to run loading turnips. I spent five nights with elderly mothers with their 50-ish year old bachelor sons. They always seemed to be very warm nights, uh, wonderful nights for me, uh, although I did read some poetry that would suggest other to great hunger by Patrick Kavanaugh talks about the destitute life that some of these sons had caring for the old ones till their dying days. Uh, this is the night I spent with the O'Briens, the tinkers or travelers as they'd rather be called in Calorgan. You can see uh, Farrah Fawcett there, uh, <laughs> oh, Charlie's Angels. Um, look. This particular night when I was there, we were around a fire and for supper, we had harsh cups of tea, slices of brown bread, slathered in butter and sprinkled heavily with sugar. And at the end, there were 45 grandchildren in the encampment. That's Queenie in the red cardigan. 45 grandchildren. And one of them, about a two-year-old, kept picking at his nose. And the, the woman said, what's on you, the mother? And the other son said, he put a berry up his nose earlier on. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the mother says, and, the chi and you left him at it, a child of breath from the death. Go into the king's caravan and get me the snuff and hurry. While the little boy went into the king's caravan to get the snuff, she had the little toddler on her knee, took a little butter, from the bread, put it up his plug nostril. When the snuff came, she dipped her other pinky into the snuff, put it up the boy's unobstructed nostril. The kid heaved and lunged, sneezed, and that berry bounced out of his nose, <laughs> off the stones, and into the fire. <laughs> and I'm on my second bottle of Guinness, and I put it down. And I say, what you just did with that butter and snuff would, co would cost $700 in an emergency room today. <laughs> this is just a rose near the coast. Because of the, the, the tough winds, they'll throw fishnet very tautly against the seawalls so the roses don't lose their petals within an hour or two but it just looked like a lovely little still. 
This is um, Tim Healy Pass in County Cork. Um, I kind of nudged Missy and said, listen, we're going to spend our night in that farmhouse. She looked at me and basically said, no, we're not. Uh, <laughs> she never liked to travel the same road up and back, and she knew when she did. Donkeys always know the road they travel. After 1,600 miles of road, we came back to where basically our journey came to a circle, a place called Carnmore Cross. And for the next 40 miles inland to get to Radigan's Pub, her gait was so lively, so unbelievably light of foot, I couldn't believe it. And Jimmy McDermott told me she knew the road as soon as she turned back. And this is after eight months. And there was no doubt that she did it. These are one of many grotto scenes in Ireland. Many of these have now since vanished because of the widening of the roads, now that the Ireland is in the European market. Another scene, horse and cart. Barra Peninsula, West Cork. This is Dulac, the Black Lake in County Mayo. This is where my hazel stick that was cut for me by a wonderful old man uh, it finally broke after 1,500 miles. Um, like the Hobbit, like Sting uh, with Bilbo Baggins, I was absolutely empty when my stick broke. Two days later, after carrying this thing for 1,500 miles, and it was such a handy thing to have because sheepdogs were a real nuisance on our travels, and they'd come up and they'd always want to snip Missy in the heels, but I could raise the stick, and I tell you, boy, after a while, a bull could come snorting my way, and with that stick, I felt like I could overpower it. But it broke here. Two days later, I'm going into Lenine, and an old man said, where's your stick? Broken over her back, was it? I said, no, I was golfing stones all the time in the road with it. And uh, he said, here, take my stick. And he gave me this lovely stick of holly that saw us home. Just another scene. That's Crow Patrick in the distance, that little dimple there. This is taken again from Clare Island, looking out. Oh, yeah, they're sheep. Yeah. Jesus, good walk. Um, below, there's a little bit of a pathway. More sheep. This is a, uh, a scene in the Falls Road, Belfast, of a little girl walking uh, past a candy store. Uh, like everything else in the north at that time, every place, newsagent, pub, confectionery store, gave the outward appearance of being closed. But once you went inside through those doors, it was as cheerful as anything you would see in the Ring of Kerry. That's another night where we spent tonight. That's uh, Crow Patrick, Patrick's Mountain, where he fasted 40 days and came down with shamrock in hand. These are the only four sheep I can beat in around the golf, the only foursome. <laughs> and this is much on the top of uh, Connor Pass uh, in Kerry, looking down. St. Declan's, Ardmore. Another roadside shrine. These is sl it's a Sleeve League. It's uh, second highest marine cliffs in Europe. They're 2,000 feet high. Um, the cliffs of Moore are 600 feet. So you can imagine the height. This picture really doesn't do the cliffs justice because I only had a 35 millimeter lens, whereas a 28 or a 24 would have really showed you the, the expanse of this. This, now we're getting into Ben Polvin or uh, Yates's country, County Sligo. Yes, yeah. This is a wind bush or a fairy bush. This is in County Mayo. They tend to leave those things alone. It's what they call a pisho, good old superstition. Just a chapel in Glen Cullum Kill called the Poison Glen. They call it there because there's, well, these people have never seen a bird fly in this area, this particular valley. You can see houses, they're all thatched homes. 
uh, on the hillsides, a very old pocket of Ireland. These are standing stones of Ogham. They were pagan stones, but Colum killed the saint, sanctified all of them. And now there's the stations of the cross uh, that go on, I believe, in latter August. Four miles, four hours later, everybody is back at Bridget McShane's pub. <laughs> this is very close to where The Quiet Man was filmed in Kong, County Galway. Just the scene of stones during a twilight in the winter. Uh, in the uh, summer, as people know, you could hit a golf ball at 11 o'clock at night in June and find it. Um, this is one of the tough little crossings I had. That's Michael Long with my stick in his hand. We got stuck there because my donkey wouldn't walk across that little watery runoff <laughs> coming from a mountain. And she positioned herself in such an awkward way at that tight curve that cars could never go either way. And, if, and within that 30 minute delay, there were two cars on one side, three on the other. If that would happen today, it would look like the Bourne Bridge going to Cape Cod on the 4th of July. No, the eyes wouldn't do it. Basically what had happened was, um, <laughs> it was the sound that bothered her. So Michael Long, a well-known horseman, just twisted her ears like licorice. You know, and basically led her across with me pushing the cart from behind. It's just Nakala Mountain, Devil's Backbone, they call that, and Donegal, a little calf in the forefront. It's just a, a marker telling us how far we have yet to go. Two little children that basically told me where to camp out on this particular night. Two other little children doing their homework. Uh, winter, a house that we stayed in towards the end of our travels, probably about December 18th or so. Yes. Well, no, in the 20s, they had a, many of these double story houses were built. Just a scene through the bogs in winter. And this is street art on Grafton Street. This was taken uh, the day my 80 pounds were stolen. Um, you basically throw coins, thanks. And it's a great reminder for me to, um, to thank people for coming. I want to thank Tom and Beth O'Keefe for having me and Michelle for having me come to this lovely thing. And I suppose I'll get top billing next year. For the 12th annual. <laughs> and I want to thank my dear friend Dick Falkenbush who stepped in tonight, whom I haven't seen in probably 30 years. So thanks a lot, and everybody else here. Um, this is a scene at the end of our journey. That's Jimmy McDermott with the pint glass in his hand, very happy. That's my dear wife, Belita. And there's a man in the back just around my nose named Willie Cassidy. And he probably came out with the line that caught all the lines that Christmas Eve. It started at 4.30 in the afternoon, and it was just about time for Mass, midnight Mass, when we all poured out of Radigan's pub. But he looked at me, looked at the donkey, looked at Belita, then looked back at the donkey and says, I don't know how a man in his common mind would ever leave that woman behind a year to walk dead ass around <laughs> Ireland. <laughs> Years later, to, uh, Missy was auctioned off for charity on the Late Late Show in Dublin. Seven years later, I made good my promise to Belita. I came home, fair husband, decent father. We had two lovely boys, six and three at this time, Eamon and Brendan, and we were able to buy the donkey back uh, after some worrisome searching because she had fallen into bad hands. And um, after we had our year in County Clare, we went back to uh, my aunts and uncles where Missy lived a very long life 
Uh, in fact, she did a lot better than the jackass that walked alongside of her for the next 15 years. The unfortunate part about it was Dear Missy never had a fall, although, believe me, she was ripe and eager to have one during our go-round. <laughs> but we had a veterinarian come into the house when we were living in Clare, and he gave her a good inspection because she was still young enough to have a fall. And he came back in from the buyer where she was, sat down heavily in the chair, and said, I don't understand it at all. I've never seen anything like it. And I said, What's that, doctor? Well, it seems as though your donkey prefers your breed over her own. <laughs> and I never quite knew if that was a compliment or not. <laughs> but she never had a foal. And here's the last picture taken on that glorious Christmas Eve where the dear, the handsome couple. <laughs> I was beginning to look more like her than the other way around. <laughs> Believe me, if it went another year or two, you wouldn't be able to tell us apart. You, know? <laughs> you can begin to see the sharp pointing of my ears. <laughs> you know? This was beginning, it was going to work. I knew it could work. Uh, but either which way, Thanks a million, everybody, for... You can shut off the light. Yeah. Well, is there a question or two before I take to my bed? How did you get into the idea? Oh, the whole idea? Um, well, after reading The Hobbit, I said to Belita, I want to write Ireland's Heidi. I want to write a children's story. And when I went to Ireland, the postal strike kept us out of contact for five and a half months. Therefore, there was no money. There were a lot of difficulties. But my little heroine, her name was Eileen Gibbons, and I wanted to take her across. She had to walk across the bog at night to get to an uncle's house. And I could not write the paragraphs. And I said, now I know why. I don't know myself what it's like to walk a bog. And then I thought about a bicycle. But a bicycle was too common because I just wanted to get out into the country and meet the old people. And in 79, Ireland was nothing but elderly people. It was phenomenal. Today, it's all youth, which is tremendous. But it was all aged. It was almost as if, if Ireland was a ladder there'd be three or four rungs missing because it was elderly and a few young families and lots of young kids. And it was very odd for me. And all the old men and women always came out, of course, to chat. But when I was peddling to my grandmother's house, after three desperate months in Ireland, having accomplished nothing, I saw a farmer tipping a donkey in a cart along the road. And really, it struck me like that. I said, that's how I'm going to walk Ireland and no Ireland. And you know what? It was the best devised plan I could ever in my pop come up with because I pulled the heartstrings of every Irish person because they had all worked with donkeys and carts in their youth. And it was just, Missy was my meal ticket. And also that slow pace is, is nice because you, you get to really smell and see the yeah. landscape in a, in a way that is... Oh, very is, much. You know, yeah, and every night was so different from the next. And we set off leaving a lovely home, wonderful people, sometimes with, most times with breakfast, sometimes with the lunch. And then I'd walk this uncertain road that I had never traveled before, knowing at the end of the night I was going to end up with another wonderful family. And it happened night after night. I think so, but I think things have changed dramatically. There was one night in Donegal where it was kind of a harsh night, but I liked sleeping outdoors because you'd wake up fresh in the morning. And um, the woman said, no, you will not sleep outside. You'll sleep with little Timmy, a small boy in a big bed, five years of age. And Timmy says, I don't mind as long as the donkey man doesn't snore. <laughs> So there I was with a little five-year-old. And I spoke to them uh, as I was putting this book together. And uh, 
They said, she said, I can hardly believe that we did it then. But, she said, there was some trust about you. And I think when you have to knock on a door every night and have this, this look of trust that I'm going to do nobody any harm, I'm going to be out next morning, regardless of weather. I don't smoke. I have my own provisions. And this is what I hope to do. They really, they opened their arms to me. And I think after meeting good people day after day, some of that rubbed off. And of course, walking alongside the little biblical beast. <laughs> you know? But it was that. And, now, and television has killed Ireland. They have the Sky Channel. We could not, Belinda and I were there in 1977, and we thumbed the roads, and we always were given a ride. Sometimes I would step out on a road just to take a walk, and cars would stop and ask you if you needed a lift somewhere. Now, every time you see a television show, if you see a hitchhiker on the road to start a movie or a driver, you know they're not good, that something bad is basically going to happen. Whereas when we caddied at the country club at Pittsfield, we thumbed all every day, you know, for years, even in the 60s with us in America. But I think television has really tarnished the trust in people. I mean, tremendously so. And also, drugs have made their way into Dublin and some of the cities. Crime also. I tell you, Ireland has embraced Europe in many, many ways, and America. But it was... Uh, People say, are you surprised that Ireland is doing so great now? I am not surprised, because when I walked donkey, you know, 79, the greatest crop I saw were the children. They had great schooling, they had two parents, they came home, there was very little television, they had a wonderful schooling system based on the English schooling system. Many of them spoke two languages, some three, especially in the East. No surprise that they didn't come on great guns. Any other questions? <laughs> oh, yes. You use the word uh, pilgrim in your title. Now, that suggests um, a religious aspect or a religious motivation. Mm -hmm. How does that fit into the whole thing? I think, first of all, my grandmother, who was very, very spiritual. I call her my spiritual lodestar. Um, she gave me holy water. Before I left, sprinkled it. She'd say the beads every night. We grew up the same way in Massachusetts. I never really hugged it so much. Um, but I think it comes to you in Ireland, not only because of the people, God willing, God trust. Well, I'll see you tomorrow, God willing. Everything was based basically on that. And I think to walk outdoors and to be part of the elements uh, will bring on a, a whole spiritualness that you wouldn't have otherwise. Certainly I didn't. I mean, I could go to communion and just walk the next five miles in a daze, and that just hasn't happened since. But that's the way you get. I brought my old rosary beads from confirmation days. I dipped them in every holy well. <laughs> they meant so much to me. I felt I could never, nothing would ever go wrong. I had this incredible faith during my go-round that nothing would go wrong. And it's a shame that it didn't sustain itself. I mean, I get waves, but it just doesn't last like it did. I mean, it took me 25 years to write the book. Uh, I never doubted the journey of the donkey. I always doubted the journey of the book. Two different things, I suppose, but it was being outdoors, seeing lovely things day after day, and surprising things. Like the last picture, there were so many coincidences on the road that many of them I couldn't book. I couldn't put in the book because it would sound too cornball. Um, with a mile to go on the road, a pheasant just brushed off from the hedges and left those two beautiful feathers behind that I put into Missy's bridle. Those two feathers are the exact same color as the brown and yellow cap that this lovely woman in Donegal had knitted for me knowing that I was coming. And it more or less brought the journey to a close, just that. And it was like the hazel stick with the holly stick. It was like when I needed five pounds, I got five pounds. It was when Missy only had a handful of oats, a farmer would stop by and say, how you set for oats? But it happened night after night. And that's why I always felt compelled to write the book, because if I didn't, I would have failed everybody. You know, 
Uh, and that was the great difficulty. And the millstone around my neck, it was too grand of a journey to let go without telling people about. Well, thank you. <laughs> I do have a few books. Um, I actually I have seven books. 700, uh, sorry. Uh, no, and, and thanks a million, uh, this is wonderful, to be at St. Mike's first time. So I'd love to have seen that guy hit a jump shot during his days. <laughs> hit a sweetest shot from the corner. You know? So thanks so much. Yeah, and I'll sit here.